Hi everyone, you're listening to the Health and Wellbeing Podcast. I'm Alison Mitchell, a practicing naturopath, and you can find me on naturopathnsw.com.au. Today I'm talking with Ashley Hunt. These podcasts will feature discussions on various health conditions, health tips, and nutrition from a naturopathic perspective. Sometimes it's just me, sometimes I'm interviewing guests. All the time, I hope to share with you information on health and well-being with the aim to empower and educate. Please remember that all information is general and not a specific recommendation that replaces consulting with a practitioner. Please talk to your healthcare practitioner before undertaking any changes to your treatment regime. So Ashley Hunt is a personal trainer and wellness coach with a holistic and balanced approach to health. Ashley specializes in helping clients build their confidence, as well as creating quick quick and effective workouts that can be done anywhere. Her signature style focuses on high intensity functional body weight exercises, incorporating a combination of yoga, Pilates, gymnastics, and calisthenics. So hi, Ashley. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Alison. No problem at all. Happy to talk to you. That's awesome. So what have you been getting up to lately? So I actually this year um, just moved to London. So I moved from Sydney to London. Um, I moved at the end of February, so I've been here for five months now. So I've essentially just um, been setting up my business over here. So my personal training and wellness coaching business um, and familiarizing myself with the fitness and um, well-being industries in London. And yeah, it's going really well. Awesome. So if you're all the way over in London, there's there's a bit of a time difference between us. It's <laughs> yes, uh, pretty it much like 5 p.m. here. I've just finished work. I've been at clinic all day. What, have, what time is it over there for you? So it's nearly 8 a.m. over here. Oh, so you're, <laughs> you're a bit of an early riser. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely like to um, get an early start to the day. I basically just don't like to waste any time, so I'm generally up pretty early. Um, I'm not going to lie, I'm still um, in my (laughs) pyjamas. It's Friday (laughs) today, so Friday is usually my lazy day, so I've just got a cup of tea and I like to just start the day by reading my emails and um, yeah, just doing doing a bit of reading, a bit of research and just not rushing into anything. I also have a cup of tea. <laughs> this is my, <laughs> my wind down tea though after a long day. <laughs> That's great. I love that. We're so far away and it's a totally different time, but we're both here drinking our tea. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's funny because tea is like one of those things that you hear about with being such a Europe, like an English thing, but it's also very Australian yeah. now, I guess. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. They love their tea over here. Don't get me wrong. I drink coffee as well. Um, but over here, tea is definitely, definitely more common. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I watch a bit of the Simon Pegg movies and um, they're always having their tea in that. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly like that. That's pretty yeah. much what it is. <laughs> so how, how long has it been since you moved to London? So it's been um, about five months, just over five months. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it feels like I've been here forever. (laughs) I've really just settled in. Um, It feels like home. And, yeah, I don't don't know when I'll be back or at this stage I can't really imagine coming home anytime soon. So (laughs) That's lovely. Have you had much of a transition with your diet since you've moved? Mm. Because I remember Um, when I went to went to London which was about eight years or so I went with Tim's family it was pretty difficult to find healthy food at the time like I came back yeah. and I was just craving salads and pretty much mm. anything green <laughs> I can imagine um it is really different over here um so I'm celiac so I follow uh, obviously a strict gluten-free diet um so it has been a transition for me to come to London and try and find gluten-free food over here um, it's definitely not as widely available as it is in Sydney, um, which is no. where I'm from. Mm. Sydney is just so, um, it's just so easy to get gluten-free food. You can get it almost everywhere and it's not just gluten-free, but you can also get nut-free, dairy-free, vegan, paleo. Um, so Sydney is great for, for any sort of, um, special dietary requirements, but coming to London, it has been a little bit harder to, um, to find decent food. The supermarkets are great. Um, they have free from sections that are absolutely packed with foods um, because it's easier for them to get all of these different products from the rest of Europe. 
um, which we don't get in Australia. But eating out is a lot harder. So eating um, in a restaurant and um, even just restaurant staff understanding what gluten is and Mm. what foods have gluten and what doesn't. Um, It's definitely been a little bit of a process, but I'm I'm constantly surprised. I recently did a little drive, um, went to some country towns and managed to find gluten-free scones. (laughs) So we were able to have a cream tea, (laughs) which was amazing. (laughs) Because when in London, one has to have scones. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) Um, so yeah, little things like that. I'm, I'm, I'm always surprised, but it, it has been a little bit of an adjustment. Like it means that I do make a lot of my own food, <clears throat> um, probably yeah. more than I ever needed to back home, but, um, no, it's been, it's been really good and they're definitely catching on. It's, it's happening. Like it's following the, the trends, you know, from Sydney, from LA, from New York and, um, yeah, definitely awareness is spreading. There's a long way to go, um, but yeah, England is definitely becoming more and more healthy every day. Yeah, well, I, ma- I imagine that the hardest thing is that issue that you have with the wait staff and the chefs and things like that because you say, I'm a celiac, and they go, oh, whatever, pish posh. Exactly. She can handle a little bit of gluten. And then it's like, well, with, with celiac, it's like you can't handle any. Even if you Absolutely. get away symptom free, it's still doing damage. That's exactly right. That's that's what people don't understand is that, yeah, I might not, um, you know, like crash to the floor and need to be hospitalized, but every little bit of gluten that you give me is affecting my body, um, even the smallest amount. And mm. um, it's doing um, it's, it's, it's doing a lot of damage and it's basically means that the rest of the time that I spend working so hard on eating gluten-free, you know, it almost goes to waste just from a little bit of gluten. So that's, that's a shame. Um, but no, people are starting to take it more seriously, which is really good. Yes. There was a, um, a celiac awareness week, um, that happened over June here. So things like that are, you know, it's great to see it is getting out there. Yeah, that's good. I know I, I've, I was listening to a seminar by Sue Shepherd, who did the, the FODMAP diet pioneering. Oh, yeah. And she yeah. does a bit of work with celiac people as well, actually, like quite a lot of work. And she was saying that the research that she's found is that it takes sometimes 12 to 24 months to repair the villi after having gluten exposure in celiac. So yep. you, it's just such a massive reaction. <laughs> It is, it is, it is massive Um, and that's just what people don't realise is just how much even like the smallest amount of gluten can really affect you. Um, So people, people say, you know, like, oh, but can't you just have like a little bit? Like, how do you not have any gluten ever? And I'm like, no, I can't. I I literally cannot. It's just, it's that bad for me. I used to work in... And it's not just a diet thing. It's not just a weight loss thing. Like, yeah. I just cannot ever eat gluten. And, and you're not even just doing it to be fashionable and that sort of exactly. thing as well, which a lot of people, people think. People find that really hard to comprehend. I know. Um, <laughs> I wrote an article about um, food intolerances and things like that as well, and it was trying to sort of get people to understand the difference between food intolerances and food allergies and celiac as a whole different ball game altogether. Yeah. Um, I was remembering how I used to work at a cafe and so where people would say, like, is this this gluten-free? And I was studying naturopathy at the time and I would go back to the chef and I would ask and they would say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. And I'm, and I'm like, oh, but they're actually celiac, so it can't have any, like it can't even be cooked in the oil with the flour and um, like that sort of thing. And they're like, yeah, right. <laughs> they can handle a bit. So they, they were just oh, sort of scoff, scoffing about it. <laughs> yeah. So oh, I, I, hate I had to use, like yeah, <laughs> I had to use my knowledge of celiac and gluten and things like that to actually sort of override what the chef said. Yeah, no, I absolutely think I'm sure that you helped a lot of people out by doing that. I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, but, um, it's good that it is starting to get in a bit better in London for, for everyone that does have those sorts of issues. Definitely. What about and just for the general public as well, just that there is so much more healthy food being yeah. offered every single day over here. Um, it's a really exciting sort of period of change, so it's it's nice to be here during this time. Mm. And I think that it would be hard for anyone just when you move as a general thing wherever you're moving to just to find new places to eat. And Did you have to do a lot of research before you went to, to find that out? Yeah, absolutely. You do. 
it's moving countries, you know, you've always, if you want to try and, you know, you're working so hard on your, on your health and, and how you feel, you want to make sure that you don't just give it all up, you know, just because you're moving country. So a little bit of preparation goes a long way. Um, but one of the things that I love doing since I've arrived is just exploring, you know, like essentially I'm a tourist and I love going out. And for me, it's like really exciting when I find, you know, different healthy cafes and health food and organic stores. Um, so all of those little discoveries um, are really exciting for me. But I think that you, it does take a little, like there is an adjustment period and you need to, um, you need to be willing to accept that that's going to happen. Um, yeah. But at the same time, while you're going through that adjustment, you want to be really careful that you don't just give it all up. You know, you work so hard on your health if you're moving overseas. It's easy to just sort of be like, oh, I'm on holiday. I'm going to, you know, just eat whatever I want, stop exercising. But yeah, you, you don't say, oh, yeah. bugger it. Or, well, you wouldn't exactly. say that in London, would you? That's an Australian thing to say. <laughs> You could, people might not understand you, but <laughs> yeah, so I think that, you know, enjoy yourself, that's definitely, you know, my whole health philosophy is just making sure you enjoy the whole process, um, and moving overseas is so sort of exciting, you don't want to, you know, take away from it just because you're, you know, you're trying to stick to a strict diet, but um, but absolutely don't, don't be tempted to give it all up, you know, it's a process, just take it nice and slow, you know, you're going to be discovering all these new um, places to eat and um, fitness studios and, and things like that, and eventually you're going to get yourself into a nice routine just like you had at home. Yeah, I guess, and like, I like what you said, you have fun with it and you explore and, and all of that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it makes a big difference and it just makes it so much easier and yeah, so much more enjoyable. Mm. And how about with your exercise as well? Did you find that it was difficult to settle into your exercise routine after you moved? Yeah, definitely. I, um, I'm really big on routine. Um, I need to know exactly when I'm going to exercise. It needs to be planned in my um, diary, you know, a, a week in advance. And then it comes up and I just do it and I don't even think about it. Um, but obviously moving country and then trying to set up my business over here, my routine was all over the place. Um, so it actually took me a little while to get back into a decent exercise routine. Um, for exercise as well, I do um, – I don't just, you know, go to the gym and work out three times a week. Like I do lots of really different things. I go to lots of different studios. And for me, that's really important because I love to mix it up because I get, um, I get bored <laughs> otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it was about finding different studios um, that I wanted to go to that were close to where I was living, you know, like sort of exploring my area. Um, it was definitely also – a lot colder here obviously um because <laughs> I moved over in um it was the end of winter but it was still winter and um yeah I exercise outdoors a lot so that was a big difference for me because I didn't want to I didn't want to go outside yeah it was too cold yeah um, I know I've been following some of your pictures where you, you're you're showing how to do these workouts on benches and things like that. And <laughs> so I'd imagine that's, um, I'm going to do that in a, in a fur coat, <laughs> not actually a fur coat. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Like a puffer yeah. jacket sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, it's, um, it's obviously much warmer now and, you know, it is actually nice to get outside in the, in the really fresh air and you're, and you're exercising. So you're warming yourself up anyway, but it definitely, there was that adjustment period. Um, and, you know, I'm just like everybody else. I can, I can feel unmotivated and, you know, there are times when I just don't feel like exercising, especially when so much else is going on. Um, but I definitely managed to find, um, find the studios that I want to go to, find the people that I want to work out with. Um, and I've got a great routine um, now that I've um, set in motion and I love it. Nice. Yeah. So what would you recommend then? Like, so if someone was about to move or have just moved, would you, would you say what are the, the key points so that their health isn't affected by the process? So if you're planning to yeah. move, so it's, if it's going to be like a, like a permanent thing. Um, so I guess if you know exactly where you're going to be living, um, so that I didn't know that when I first came to London, I was staying oh, okay. didn't know where I was going to end up being based. 
Um, but if you if you know, you can definitely do a lot of research in advance. But things like, you know, the, the fitness studios that you go to, for example, the yoga classes that you take, it's so trial and error because for me, I think it's really personal. Um, instructors, you, you know, you either get along with them or you don't or, you know, you like their style or you don't. Um, but yeah, just take it as a, just take it as a journey, make it part of your experience to try out all these new places. And it's really exciting. You're going to come across some, some awesome places, do as much research as you can. But at the same time, you know, some of the, some of the yoga studios, um, some of the best fitness studios, you're not going to be able to find out exactly what they're like online. So it's a matter of just coming here and just doing some exploring. Just um, jumping but in. Also, yep. Exactly. But also there's so much that you can do just at home, you know, even if you've got the smallest room, um, all the workouts that I, that I do and that I create, um, you can do absolutely anywhere with very little space and you need no equipment. So there's no reason that you can't, um, be, be working out even when you're in that transition, in that transition phase. I totally agree. And that is my preferred style of exercise is stuff that I can do in the lounge room because yep, for me, exactly. the biggest hurdle to exercise is to actually getting out the door or yep. like to put like to do my hair or whatever in a, mm-hmm. in a element that's sort of half um, presentable. Yeah, <laughs> um, absolutely. Like, I know exactly you, what you mean. You can just wear the daggiest stuff and have your totally. hair like crap when you're <laughs> exercising. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't matter. That's it. And that's the thing is it's all about finding out um, what works for you. So I know a lot of people who, you know, need to go to the gym because they need to like sort of separate it. And then, you know, once they're at the gym, they're they're feeling motivated because, you know, I'm, I'm, I've come all this way. I might as well make it worth it. Um, that's not for me. That's not my style. I really need to wake up first thing in the morning, um, bust out a workout before I can even think about it. It could be in my bedroom, could be in my lounge room, could be in my backyard, um, whatever I feel like. But, um, and I'm, you know, essentially most of the time just throwing on whatever clothes. Yeah. My hair's a mess. (laughs) Um, but I just get it done and then I just don't have to think about it for the rest of the day. And, um, I know that I've done something. So yeah, it's all about finding out, finding out what works for you. But there are definitely no excuses. Um, money should never be an issue because you don't need any money to work out at home. Time shouldn't be an issue because you can do um, a great workout in five or ten minutes. And yeah. um, equipment's no issue. You don't need anything. So yeah, just your own be on body weight. <laughs> Exactly. I'm actually so sore at the moment. I have like, oh my gosh, my legs are so tired from <laughs> a workout that I just did in the park yesterday with a girlfriend. Um, just we were walking to have lunch and just thought we would do something really quickly <laughs> before we ate. And it took us probably seven minutes. Um, but it was what we did was so effective that um, it's definitely, definitely done some good. I can feel it in my legs. <laughs> nice. But I do like the idea of doing just the short workouts when you can and so busting that out at home is always a good thing to do because I think if you do sort of say, oh, well, I can't exercise today because I don't have the hour and a half that it takes or people people, um, thinking that they have to set their alarm clock at 3 o'clock in the morning. To me, I don't don't think that's very good for you to do that. No, it's not. It's not realistic. It's also not sustainable. Like you might do it for three or four weeks but you'll give it up eventually. Mm. Yeah. Um, just because it doesn't fit into your lifestyle. We have such busy lifestyles these days. Exactly. We need to make it work. We need to put realistic plans in place. It's fine when you're super motivated and you um, you say, I'm, I'm, I want to start being healthy, I'm going to get fit, and you start making all these plans to go to the gym for an hour. But it doesn't, that's not, that's not real life. It doesn't always work out like that. Unless you, you know, obviously, unless you're an athlete, if you've been doing it for years, that's fine. But especially for people first getting started, um, just, you've got to start nice and slow. And there's plenty, plenty of things that you can do in a short amount of time mm-hmm. that are going to give you the same, if not better results. You know, if you're working out effectively um, and it's efficient, you're still going to be able to get those results. Exactly. And I think that there is well, one of the concerns that I have is for people doing these really, really long duration exercise that they are putting a lot of strain on their adrenal glands. And so then they're going to be more prone to injuries and adrenal exactly. fatigue and stress and things like that as well. And I loved your um, recent post about um, CrossFit just calm down. 
<laughs> How great was that? <laughs> um, I yeah, totally that's agree. Actually a huge concern of mine as well. Um, I really don't believe in overtraining, and I feel like we are living in a society where overtraining is essentially glorified. Um, and I'm not sure how that happened, but, um, you know, it became cool to like vomit after an exercise, after exercising, <laughs> but people are not realizing that exercise puts a lot of stress on your body. It's a good thing in a way, um, because yeah, you're, you're training your, your body to become stronger. Um, your heart's going to be working more efficiently, but there is a limit and, um, rushing into too much exercise or doing it at too high intensity, um, especially when you haven't been doing it like that before can actually really stress your body out. Um, and it's not good for you. Yeah, exactly. And it can result, result in all sorts of things, including weight gain because your yeah. body, you know, starts to think, okay, uh, all of a sudden I'm doing all this exercise. I better start, um, eating more mm. and storing more energy. And, yeah. um, yeah, people find that they're actually putting on weight when they start exercising. Yeah, it is. A, it is an issue. So I think you've got to listen to your body and that. Absolutely, and absolutely. I, I personally recommend a balance of different types of exercise, like a bit of weight training Definitely. and a bit of yoga and like yeah. a bit of high-intensity interval training, but uh, yeah. not so much for the um, long-distance running and things like that. That's a very It's, a, it's so personal though. Yeah. I think, I think that the, the biggest thing is that um, you have to find what works for you because if you don't like it, you're not going to do it. If you don't enjoy it, mm. you're going to always be finding excuses and it's never going to work out for you. Yeah. I personally like the balance. So I do – my week would look like um, – I generally try and do three exercise sessions per week. Um, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, and I'm okay with that. One is a very high-intensity strength training um, because that's what I enjoy. Yep. Um, one is – a yoga flexibility mobility style training and the other is cardio um, so if it involves running cycling whatever it is um, and it's usually interval so that's me for example sprinting and then jogging sprinting and then jogging hills things like that oh nice yeah that's I what think my that's great. workout looks like <laughs> And, um, well, I guess anyone who follows you on social media would also see that you're a big fan of pole for fitness too. I love pole fitness, exactly. Yes. Um, so the intense style of um, strength training that I do is actually aerials. So it is, you know, it's essentially like circus training um, and then incorporates pole fitness, which a lot of people don't realize they, they go together. Um, so at the moment I'm focusing on a discipline called straps, but, um, I definitely still pole dance. I was a pole dance instructor in Sydney. Uh, it's, it's my favorite form of exercise. It's actually what got me into exercise. Um, I used to be the kind of person where the most movement I did in a week was like walking from the couch to the fridge to get snacks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was definitely very lazy and I just didn't like, I just didn't like exercising. I had never been to the gym before. It wasn't until I started pole dancing that I realized, Hey, this can be really fun and I'm getting a really good workout. Mm. So I, and you've got to make I it fun. Doing it. Exactly. Yeah. You have otherwise to enjoy what you're doing. Yeah. Otherwise you won't keep going. Definitely. Definitely. And I think that that's, you know, it comes into having, you know, a trainer that's there to motivate you or working out with a friend so you can have a giggle along the way. You've got to find what works for you. But um, I can guarantee you that pole fitness is just so much fun and mm. it's so effective. It's, it is, um, it's essentially like calisthenics. It's body weight training. You're using your body. You're just holding it in different ways on the pole. So you develop extremely good upper body and um, core strength mm. and um, and your overall flexibility and mobility just increases. Um, so it's yeah. just, it's, it's so good for you. And, uh, and how long have you been doing it for? Um, I was doing pole dancing for about two years, yep. two, two and a half years. Okay. And yeah, I think that it's good for women particularly to develop that upper body strength because that's just something that... We just don't really have that ability to develop in a lot of other ways apart from lifting weights specifically, but that's exactly. using it's your, your whole body. We, it's good. It doesn't come naturally to us, the upper body strength, unfortunately. Mm. Um, but if you if you see um, 
pole dancers can bust out, you know, 10 um, pull-ups, which is extremely rare for women um, to be able to even do one Come unassisted pull-up. Yeah, I, um, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, pole dancers are de- developing really, really good real-world strength. They can lift their bodies and hold their bodies in incredible ways. Um so it's just it's it's extremely effective for that for the upper body strength for the core strength as well um a lot of people think of it as just you know the the sexy dancing around a pole wearing high heels which is fine a lot of it is that a lot of it is sexy and a lot of women love it for that reason um it definitely doesn't have to be like that i personally um hardly I think I probably have worn heels twice to dance and it's just not my thing it just doesn't doesn't work for me um for me it's much more about the fitness than it is about the um about the dancing um but I just I just absolutely used to love going to work as a as a pole dance instructor and um my students would just have so much fun you know we just spent all class um laughing but at the same time getting a workout but not even like realizing that you're actually exercising and how quickly um, and then, did it work to like to get the strength in order to be able to do a pull up? Oh my goodness, it's so much faster than you think. You do so generally pole studios would have a term of about eight weeks. And by the end of the eight weeks, so your first beginner's course, you are so much stronger. Like you cannot believe the things that you're already able to do. Um, and then, yeah, as the terms go on and as you progress through the levels, your strength is just increasing all the time. And before you know it, you can, yeah, you can hold your own body weight, which is, which is a great skill to have. And then, yeah, you can even pull yourself up. Nice. Um, and it probably, yeah, if you're, if you're doing a couple of sessions per week, you're, you know, you're seeing huge gains within two or three months. I've always found it really interesting, but um, my fear is that I would just bruise so easily because I already do have a bit of a tendency to bruise easily. Do you know what? I'm not going to have good news for you. <laughs> it, um, you definitely, if, especially if you have the tendency to bruise, you will be covered in bruises if you do pole dancing. You're mm. constantly knocking into the pole. The pole is obviously um, very hard and um, a lot of girls end up with, with with bruises all over their legs and arms. And I personally don't bruise very easily. Um, so I know that, you know, when I come up with a big bruise, I've obviously done something. <laughs> yeah, you smacked something. it. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of, a lot of girls, you know, they get, they get the bruises, but they love it so much that it doesn't really, Mm. you know, it doesn't bother them. We call them pole kisses. A lot of girls also (laughs) take pictures of them and like compare their pole kisses. And (laughs) that's so funny. Um, Yeah. (laughs) And I don't think it would be something that would particularly get better. Although if you're knocking into the pole, then that could be your, your technique, I guess. But do you know what it does? Um, so the bruises do go away because your skin gets used to it, but with every new move that you learn, the bruises come back because it's a slight, it's, you know, it's, it's using your body in a slightly different way. So as much as the old yeah. ones go away, you'll always be getting new ones if you're, if you're learning new things, unfortunately. Oh, well. <laughs> the less glamorous side of folding. There's dancing. a lot of other benefits associated <laughs> with it. We also get, um... We also get um, calluses on our hands, so like any man who weightlifts, yeah. um, that's also unfortunate. Um, and you can't wear so, the gloves to prevent that, can you? Because you need the grip. You can, but um, like if we do, like there are gloves that you can wear that actually help you grip. Um, but I mean, you want to, you want to just try and you don't, you don't really care about those things when you're learning cool tricks and having a good time. It just yeah. sort of comes with the territory, and you just embrace it. What do you think about the negative stigma associated with it? Though? Um, it's it's sad. It's something um, that happens a lot. Um, when I was very focused on my pole dancing and when I was teaching, you know, essentially it was my job. I took it very seriously, um, and I loved I loved what I did because I got to see women absolutely transform. Um, they would come into their first class with me, a little bit shy possibly scared about what they were about to do and they would leave at the end of the eight weeks just a completely different person um pole dancing gives you so much confidence you really get to take charge of your body you realize how strong you can be um you realize what your body's capable of and you're doing things that you never imagined you could do 
So for me, it's just been such a powerful tool for myself, for myself building confidence and then passing that on to others. Um, and so it, I find it really sad when people um, just make a quick judgment. Yeah. I totally understand where it comes from. They're making that association between pole dancing and stripping, um, which is fine if that's all that they know. Um, but what people don't realize is that pole dancing didn't come from stripping. Um, so pole dancing is essentially like gymnastics on a pole. Mm. And it's been around for thousands of years. It started in India and China. Um, and if you were to look up on Google Chinese pole or Indian pole, um, you would you would find men doing pole. I think in, um, in India they used a wooden pole and in China it's rubber. Mm. So this is I've, where I've definitely started. seen men do pole dancing as well. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. Men do pole dancing. And, um, yeah, so we really need to try and stop that association between pole dancing and stripping because it is different. Mm. Um, that is, you know, exotic dancing for a specific purpose, um, whereas pole dancing is gymnastics. It's fitness. It's so good for you. It's such a shame for it to have this stigma. Mm. Um, but all I, I just I just don't like it when people judge it too quickly. Um the thing is that the people who are judging it don't know anybody that does it. As soon as you know somebody, you know, someone close to you and you think, hang on, you know, they're my friend and they're really normal and they're doing pole dancing, it, there must be more to it that I'm missing. Um, and I guarantee as soon as you know somebody who does pole dancing, you hear them talk about it, you see the way that they change from doing it, how confident they become, the way that they hold themselves, how strong they become, you absolutely cannot continue to have that negative opinion about pole dancing yeah i agree i i think that it is wonderful that you do get that confidence from it definitely definitely. it's interesting how uh, i i didn't realize that you could also go to studios that have the straps and things like that as well there there isn't anything like that where i am from (laughs) (laughs) okay um yeah so essentially it's just like as i said it's just another form of like aerial discipline so um there are aerial studios that have um so silks and lira which is the the hoop and um trapeze and straps and pole is is just another it's just another form of aerials Mm. I've been. I just saw this video about the American Ninja Warrior um, yeah. show, and there was this this five foot girl that just smashed the entire course, and I was like, the "Oh, gymnast. that is gold!" How amazing is yeah. she? Yeah, yeah, that's I love it. she was the gymnast, and I was like, "That yeah. is goals. And so I think that's the sort of um, t- train, almost like the training that you guys would be doing. Um, it's so similar, exactly. You're using your body in you know a really, really, really similar way. And you can see how, like, you yeah. know, just from watching that, exactly, it's functional. And um, she was ridiculously strong, <laughs> so impressive. I saw that and I was like, oh, my God, I need to do this. This is, like, my inspiration to continue training. <laughs> what I loved about her as well was that she was so petite and that she – you, you do get a lot of fear from women about doing any form of exercise and that they're going to get bulky. And it's Yeah, like, absolutely. She was so strong, yet you wouldn't be able to sort of tell that just from looking at her. Yeah, that's um, that's something I'm, – I'm really small as well, so I'm, like, actually little. Like, I'm 5'3". I'm you are um, tiny. And... <laughs> <laughs> well, and, I, don't, um... I don't mean short tiny, but petite tiny. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, I, people look at me and, and they, they, they just go, oh my God, you're so small. I'm like, thank you for pointing that out to me. (laughs) Um, but then people are always surprised by how strong I am because I am so small and you don't look at me and think, oh my God, she's a tank. Like you, like I'm toned, but I'm not, I don't have massive muscles or anything like that. And yeah, people are always surprised about how strong I am considering, you know, what I look like and how small I am, um, Mm. which I love because my training style because it developed from me wanting to be stronger for pole, um, it's really all about strength for me. I train to be strong. I love to have a strong body. And that's because, you know, because I am small, people look at me and they think like, oh, no, don't you worry about carrying that or you don't have to help with this, you know, from like, moving something. And I'm there going, hang on, <laughs> just I'm because I'm small. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I love that. I love that as a woman, you know, we're, we're made to be, we're told that, you know, we're so frail and, you know, we're yeah. the ones that need to be protected and it's absolutely not true. 
So I love, I love, you know, helping other women um, discover how strong they can be. And it actually changes, you know, mentally your, your attitude as well. You start to think, you know, you can take care of yourself. Um, you don't need anybody to take care of you. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's really so empowering. Important. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now, um, I know that um, writing and blogging has always been a big passion of yours. When you were living here in Australia, you had this you had a beautiful website Move Eat Heal, which had some great collections of articles and recipes based around health and wellness. But um, this is so currently you've got your own blog now, and that's also releasing some beautiful mm-hmm. articles, which I just love reading. They're always oh, really interesting you. and helpful. <laughs> oh, so what's lovely? What inspires you to write, and and <laughs> how do you decide on your topics? Um, yeah, so the two were really different. Um, Move Eat Hill was a blog that I started with a friend, um, and we essentially just we love trying out different fitness classes, and we loved eating healthy food, and we just wanted to show people that you could be healthy and um, it could be really enjoyable. Um, so we just went around, tried all these different places, and then wrote about them. Um, and the blog started to become popular and, um, we then started to, um, get different contributors from, it ended up being all around the country, just as sort of like a wellbeing guide to, um, Australia, Mm. uh, which is really fun. So that was where our motivation came from. Um, we started writing as we would discover, you know, new places and new trends going around. Um, that's how we would come up with our article ideas. Um, but yeah, since I moved to London, I have left the blog behind, um, but I do still write, obviously, because um, I do love writing and I love sharing my ideas with people, um, but it's much more personal now. Um, I write my articles, I publish, I try to publish at least one article a week, um, either for my own blog or for other websites. And a lot of it is based on the questions that I'm asked by clients. Yeah. And um, if I find that I'm getting asked the same question often, then I'll always make a note to blog about it. Um, all of my articles come from the same place, which is that we really want to develop a balanced lifestyle and um, we really just want to be good to ourselves. I find a lot of people when they start to be healthy, they start trying to be healthy, they're so hard on themselves. Mm. So everything that I write is based around the the idea that we want to take care of ourselves and that's where we want our health motivation to come from. Um, but essentially it could just come from anything. I'm walking around. I have a little book that I keep with me all the time. If I'm walking around and something comes to me, I'll just, I'll just write it down. But I definitely love to just show people how easy it can be to be healthy and how, and how much fun it can be as well. So anything, um, that covers those, those two, you're probably going to find me writing about it. Nice. No, I love that philosophy. I, I think that it is very easy to sort of get get hard on yourself. And one of my things, my or I guess a mantra that I say is, don't lose lose sight of the good um, for sake of perfection. And mm, I love that. That's mm, great. And so it's just like you you do the best that you can at the yeah. time. And if you do something bad, then you forgive yourself and you <laughs> move on and. Absolutely. It it doesn't have to be perfect. (laughs) That whole idea of perfection, like it's, you know, it's, I love that mantra. It's it's really perfect and it definitely goes with what I believe. People feel like, you know, when you commit to an exercise program and you say, I'm going to be there five days a week um, for four weeks. And then as soon as you don't, as soon as you don't turn up one day, that's it. You know, the whole thing's out the window because, you know, how can you continue if you're not going to do it perfectly? And it's just, it's just not, it's just not realistic. Like I sometimes exercise once a week because it's all I have time for, or I just didn't feel like exercising the other days. And I just think to myself, that's okay. I'm really happy that that one day I managed to do a workout and it was great. I really enjoyed it. Same with my eating. You know, I don't eat perfectly all the time. I love eating and I love to enjoy food. You know, as soon as I start putting restrictions on myself, I don't enjoy it anymore. And I don't, um, my whole idea is that I want to um, generally most of the time I'm craving healthy food because it makes me feel really good. So it's all about, um, you know, if you, if you really love yourself, you want to take care of yourself and by taking care of yourself, you're, you're doing all of these healthy things naturally. And it's just, it's coming really easy to you. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a struggle and it definitely shouldn't be about perfection. Love it. Nailed it. (laughs) (laughs) 
so I or well, my next question was going to be how would you describe your personal health philosophy but I guess that's pretty much it <laughs> gosh I think that we've pretty yeah we've definitely covered it it comes across well I hope it comes across in you know everything that I say every time I answer a question you know it's it's balanced it's it's having fun it's taking care of yourself absolutely loving yourself um, and respecting yourself those are my focuses you know the exercise and the eating they all come into it but it's definitely the whole healthy lifestyle that's enjoyable is um, that's the main focus for me. Nice. And I think in terms of your diet as well, it's about generally eating clean foods and things like that as well. Mm-hmm. Like, would you fit into any particular category? Or, I mean, personally, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I'd say I the definitely... closest. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I wouldn't. No, I don't um, put any restrictions at all on my eating, obviously, except for the fact that I have to eat gluten-free, which is not as healthy as people think. Like, you can still buy gluten-free cookies. You can still, you know, have gluten-free pizza. Um, But I definitely don't put any restrictions on my eating at all. Mm -hmm. Um, I like to – I like to eat healthy food. And for me, healthy is unprocessed. Um, It's a lot of – food in its natural state um, and it's food that makes me feel good that's the focus for me I find that if I'm eating unhealthy food I don't feel very well and because I'm generally quite healthy I notice that really really easily um, but you do this is what I what I you know the place that I'm trying to get with all of my clients is you do get to a point where you start to realize how great it feels to be healthy and you start craving healthy foods because you love that feeling, you know, the energy that you get from it. Um, There's also a huge, huge link between what you eat and um, your mood. Yes. Um, And that's something that I definitely find. You know, if I find that that my mood is getting quite low, I can take a look at what I've been eating um, and there's always a connection there. So I it's getting well, to the yeah. point where eating eating healthy food is really easy because because it's what you want. It's it's what you want to eat. And like, don't get me wrong. If I am craving chocolate cake, I will eat chocolate cake and I will enjoy it and I will not feel guilty about it. Good. Um, there's definitely a time and place for a chocolate cake. Definitely. <laughs> and ice cream. <laughs> yep, definitely. No, I totally agree. And I'd say that my diet philosophy is pretty similar to that. Yeah, no, I, for me, it's just like, it's just no diet. Like, just don't even mention that word to me. Like, don't put restrictions on me. If you tell me I can't eat chocolate, it's all I'm going to think about. And I will eat the chocolate eventually. Yeah. <laughs> I'll probably binge eat the chocolate, you know, in the middle of the night. So restrictions don't work for me. I guess I'm I'm using the term diet not to mean like I'm going on a diet, but as in Absolutely. A, this as is in just like how, this, how I eat. <laughs> definitely. And I kind of hate that, you know, they've been, you know, they are like the same word because as soon as you mention diet, you just think of, you know, the all of, you know, all of the crazy restrictions that come with it, but yeah. I know what you mean. It's just it's just your your um Oh my God, what is another way to describe it? (laughs) Your eating habits. Yeah, that works. (laughs) (laughs) That'll do. Yeah. So what's a typical day of eating for you? Um, So it changes every day um, because I don't really have a, with with the work that I do, I don't, you know, I don't have like a nine to five job. Um, So I'm, my schedule is kind of all over the place, but um, I make myself a granola every week. That's because gluten-free, I don't know if you've ever tried, like a gluten-free cereal or, you know, that you buy from the supermarket, they're not good. <laughs> they taste very bad. So, Because, yeah, create... celiac can't have oats. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that is so difficult when it comes to breakfast food. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I've developed a recipe um, for granola that actually tastes really good and it's gluten-free. Ah. So I make that for myself. We might have to share that um, on the blog. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to share it. So basically the grains that I use are um, I use quinoa flakes, millet flakes, and amaranth um, like puffs. Yep. That's just the consistency that I like. Um, so a combination of those, I put in lots of um, coconut. I put in some vanilla and some cinnamon and um, some coconut oil, and I sweeten it with a little bit of um, natural maple syrup. 
Nice. And you can add whatever else you like as well. I um, like to add some crushed nuts as well and then just pop it in the oven for about five minutes then give it a stir and then pop it back in the oven for another five minutes and it's done. So I like to do that at the beginning of the week and then I can just enjoy it throughout the week. Yeah, that's so what, I have that that's ready some, to go. Yeah, exactly. So I have that uh, most mornings um, with some natural yogurt and some fruits, so um, banana or berries. And um, I'll also have a lemon tea in the morning, um, which I find is a great way to um, wake me up. And I also find it's really good for my digestion. Hmm. Um, I always have healthy snacks on me and um, that's things like boiled eggs, um, carrots, and I also make make my own like slices and I make a raw um, fudge brownie, which is really good. <laughs> so that satisfies all my like chocolate, chocolate cravings. Um, and then my lunches and dinners are, you know, lunch, I might have like a gluten-free sandwich. Um or I'll have something like I always I always have quinoa on me um, because it's a really good gluten-free staple and I'll make you know a salad with some chicken and um, some cucumber some tomato some coriander and like a yogurt tahini dressing that's one of my favorites at the moment um so yeah things like that yeah, I love tahini in a dressing, and it's just such a great source of calcium as well. Um, and like it, it makes it really creamy, so like it gives mm. you that that sort of satisfaction that you'd get from a mayo. Which I mean, I don't have a problem with mayo, but for a lot of people who can't have eggs, that's always yeah. a good alternative. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love tahini. I think the flavor the flavor is so nice. I love to put it in like a stir fry as well. Mm. I like to throw together some vegetables and um, or, and some meat as well, and with a little bit of um, tamari and tahini. Oh, nice. Delicious. So, at what point would you add the tahini in? Just sort of at towards the end. Yeah, definitely right at the end. Um, just stir it through, and um, it makes a really delicious like, you know, it's it well tahini almost like satay. Um, Exactly, exactly. Um, so it gives like that sort of like nutty flavour. It's delicious. I'm, I've got black tahini that I've been using and I, I like to sort of um, like roast, roast some sweet potato and drizzle that on and um, oh, have yeah. that for lunches and things like that or um, make a coconut ice cream out of the black tahini. That's a really oh. nice flavour. That it's, sounds amazing. Yeah, you definitely I, have to share that recipe with me. <laughs> I, I have that recipe coming out in the next month or so. On oh my, blog. my gosh! And I cannot wait to read it. Yeah, I'll, I'll shoot it through to you a little bit earlier. <laughs> oh yay! Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I could imagine like that wouldn't be so pretty putting that in a stir fry. It'd be like I just like instead of sort of squid ink in there or something. I know it wouldn't look good. It might taste good, but it yeah. might not look quite as good. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, that one won't go on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what have been some of the biggest lessons that you've learned in your health journey like through everything? Gosh, there have been so many. Um, there, yeah, the thing is that it really is a journey. You're always learning new things. I, I remember, you know, if I look back to when I first started trying to be healthy, I tried so many things that just didn't, just didn't work out, weren't sustainable. Um, which is, which you know, it's the process. It's, it's trial and error. As I keep saying, you've got to find what works for you. So the biggest lesson that I think I've learned overall is don't listen to anyone. Like just stop reading articles where someone's telling you what you have to do. Like it's non-negotiable. Like if you want to be healthy, you have to go paleo. Or if you want to be healthy, you have to do CrossFit, whatever it is. It's so much more important to find out what you enjoy, what works for you, what works for your body. What, the, the foods that you're eating, um, it's so different for every person. Somebody might, you know, um, love eggs and, you know, that's a really good source of protein for them. Um, and other people might be um, sensitive to eggs and not be able to eat them. Like I know for me – in the health industry, people talk about nuts all the time, um, and it's and it's huge, like you know, a great snack and add it to foods. Um, almond milk became a huge thing, 
for me personally, um, I find that nuts are really inflammatory. And if I have too many nuts, I feel very unwell. So, you know, that's something, that's something a bit different. Um, I was, um, when I was trying to, you know, make smoothies every morning and I was putting almond milk in them and I just thought, oh my God, but this is what every blog tells me that I need to do and that is how I'm going to be healthy. And I was like, why do I feel sick all the time? Oh. And, yeah, and then do you think, oh, well, I'm a failure now because <laughs> I didn't. Oh my God, it's so hard. Yeah, you're just like, I'm not doing something right. Um, everybody else seems to be doing yeah. Instagram is blowing up with these smoothies and I don't get it. <laughs> Um, so, but that just didn't work for me. Green smoothies don't work for me either. I'm not big on, I love juices. Um, but I don't feel like I have to have my juice every morning. It's, it's, yeah, there are different things that, that I prioritize. Um, but yeah, the green smoothie, yeah, with the almond milk and the kale wasn't my thing. And I thought, you know, like, how can I be in this industry if I can't, if I don't like green smoothies, <laughs> but you can. Well, but, well, and... You'll get banished. <laughs> <laughs> I know, exactly. They pretty much banned me on Instagram because I don't have any pictures of green smoothies. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but like, just seriously, what, what um, my biggest advice is and what I've learned is just it's all about what works for you. Don't listen to anybody else. Um, and what I do with my clients is – we figure out together what works for them. It's not me telling you, you have to do this. It's me talking with you, coaching you to figure out, you know, when is it that you feel good? When is it that you feel bad? What are the patterns? You know, what can we do to recognize this in the future? What can we start to change slowly so that you understand, you know, the effect that this is having on your body? It's all very, very, very personal. Um, I definitely don't have a solution for everyone um and that works with all of my clients absolutely not it's completely different for every single person i think i love you that is that is like my personal (laughs) philosophy as well (laughs) that's great i love you too allison yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah just that need like to take individual sort of approach to everything and just because you've read it out there doesn't mean that you have to do it and I think this is where problems happen with this internet age with information yeah. overload is that people Absolutely. are out there and they're sharing what's worked for them and you know that's yeah. great you can give it a go but don't persist if you don't feel good with it and definitely all that trying you know different things and you know doing your research but just yeah take it with a grain of salt I guess yeah and I think that's where um people who are in the industry are able to help guide people because they're aware of all the different options and they can sort of sort of give you a bit more of a guide as to what's going to work for you based on what they're able to assess from you as well like that's exactly. that's what I do in clinic is like I, I say well I know that you've got this and this and this and this so let's let's try that and then you fine tune it as yeah. they go on realizing what they Absolutely. respond to yeah definitely, definitely. And, and I think that people in our industry um I mean we need to be guides that that's absolutely it. you you just don't need somebody telling you what you need to do and that that's going to work for you and promise all these results um, because that's just not, that's just not realistic. Obviously, you know, with, with what both of us do, we can, we can, um, help you make some extreme and wonderful changes in your life and to the way that you feel. Um, but you don't need somebody to come into your life and tell you all the ways that you need to change and make you feel bad about it. You just need somebody to support you, encourage you along the way and help you find the answer. Yeah, and yeah, if you do fall off the bandwagon one day, then hey, no biggie. <laughs> Absolutely. Because that's exactly what individualized health is, is it's fitting in those lapses and things like that as well. <laughs> definitely, or, or definitely. Fitting in the treats rather. <laughs> Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. It's like having somebody there that's just there to constantly support you no matter what and, yeah, give you that extra little bit of motivation in those tough times and it's extremely beneficial to have somebody somebody to do that for you. Mm, love it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, all right, well, we're getting close to the end now, so I guess if anyone wants to get in contact with you, how can they do that? Um, so you can visit my website, which is ashleyhunt.com.au. 
And my email address is very original. It's ashley at ashleyhunt.com.au. Oh. <laughs> well, people won't forget that. <laughs> I know. Hopefully that's the idea. <laughs> that's good. And then you're on Facebook and and Instagram and everything like that I as am. well. Yes. Yeah. So for my social accounts, um, it's Ashley Hunt Wellness. Okay. Beautiful. So thank you so much for today. I've had such a fun time talking with you. Yeah, it's been great talking to you too. Thank you for inviting me. Such a pleasure. And um, if you want to catch up again anytime soon and let's share some recipes, that's going to be fun. (laughs) Absolutely, yes. All right, well, it was lovely to talk to you, Alison. Yeah, thank you. You too. Take care. So thanks everyone for listening. If you want to head over up to iTunes and leave a review, that would be lovely. And if you want to connect with me, you can find me on naturopathnsw.com.au. I'm regularly updating my website with new recipes and new podcasts going up there all the time now. So head on over. And also, if you want to subscribe to the newsletter, you can do that on the contact page. So thanks, everyone, and have a great day.